I discovered the Black Madonna on my path to find Tara, who's one of the female Buddhas in the Tibetan tradition. I had long ago left my Christian upbringing and was with a friend in Massachusetts who was in a divinity school program who just one night when we were planning a trip to India happened to show me a book on mother worship and that's where I first saw a photograph of the Black Madonna and that was probably about 1984, 83, 84, I think maybe even 83. And so we planned our trip to, and her name was Tara, and we were planning our trip to India and Nepal. She was going to take me to Nepal to see a little statue that's growing out of a rock in Farping outside of Kathmandu in the valley of Tara, this female Buddha that supposedly in the last 15 years started growing and emerging out of the rock spontaneously. And whether it was true or not, I decided this was a delightful story with the idea, it was symbolic of what seemed to be all over the globe, the feminine emerging, literally popping out of rocks and trees. And by 1985, I think it was, there were already reports in Time or Newsweek of the Madonna appearing in the barks of trees in Poland, where the patron of Poland is the Black Madonna of Częstochowa. So once again, we have this the image of the feminine literally emerging out of rocks and trees. I say literally, symbolically at least, emerging out of rocks and trees. And then of course reports from Medjugorje of Mary appearing out of thin air since 1981. So there seemed to be something in the animus mundi, the spirit of the world, with the feminine coming to the fore, being called out, emerging at this time of crisis. And one of the stories it reminds me of is a marvelous Hindu story about Durga, who was a warrior queen and a goddess that was created because there was a point in time when the world was threatened, uh, all the crops had failed, rivers had dried up, dancing had stopped, there was no song, the world was about to be destroyed by a demon called Sumba. And none of the male gods could defeat this Sumba. So finally they remembered that there was a prophecy that said only, this demon can only be defeated by a female. And so Durga was called forth out of the streams of fire of all the gods arose Durga, the great warrior queen. And she ha entered into this cosmic battle with Sumba, the buffalo demon, and battled throughout the heavens and finally was able to kill him and at that point, uh, when she won the battle with uh, Sumba, song returned, the rivers ran in their course again, crops began to grow, and she was crowned the queen of the universe, the queen of heaven. And she said, I, anytime the world is threatened, I will come again to save the world. And then she disappeared. She didn't want to stay around and have power and control things. She just left. She did her job and she left. But with the promise that she would always come again. And so somehow I'm reminded of this ancient Hindu story when we have the, the stories of Tara popping up out of the rock and Mary appearing in the barks of trees or in Medjugorje and all the places around the world that she now is reported to be appearing. Whether this is happening literally or not is not so important to me. It seems to be something in the human psyche that's calling up what we perhaps know we need as an antidote. What I discovered when I was in Nepal for the first time in 1980, though I'd gone initially to look for Tara and to study more about Tara, having discovered that she was a female Buddha in the Tibetan tradition, what I discovered was when I arrived it was the middle of the festival of Durga. And that's when I first learned of the story of Durga as the queen of the universe and why she had been given that epithet and how she had saved the world and would come again. Uh, what I discovered was that if you talk to the Hindu scholars, that Durga and Tara are related. The Tibetan scholars say no, but the Hindus do. And often in Hindu poetry or Hindu literature, you'll find Tara referred to, Kali addressed as Tara, or Durga, address, these names all being interchangeable, Durga, Tara, and Kali. So what that led me to was understanding that Tara wasn't only this exquisite, peaceful, 
goddess of long life and healing or of compassionate action, she also had a, f a f side of her that was fierce. She had a fierce face. And I began to discover as I studied Tara more and more that there were multiple forms of Tara, traditionally 21 or 108 some say. And she's not only green for compassionate action and ready to step out into the world to help you the moment you call on her, the white Tara for long life and healing, but there's red Tara, there's orange Tara, there's um, blue-black Tara, there's black Tara, there's yellow Tara, so there are many forms of Tara. And she does have at least three forms that are black or dark blue-black. So again, here was this dark female divinity. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to back up because you really need to know who Tara is. <laughs> When I had left my traditional upbringing in Christianity, for many years I had no particular spiritual path. I left all that behind because I thought if I couldn't be the tradition I was raised in, Catholic, I, there was nothing else I could be that I was aware of. So in, to make a long story short, in the end I decided that there must be some way of acknowledging the spiritual dimension that is obvious that we have in life. I'm a mother, I have three children. I know that there's some benevolence and beauty that moves and undergirds this great creation we call the world. So how to acknowledge that in my everyday life? I attempted to go back to the church and found that impossible, but I did then begin to study Buddhism, which was non-theistic, so it was very uh, opening for me to find a way of honoring the sacred in everyday life but without having to wrestle with the kinds of problems that my traditional background had left me with, with the image of the male, the angry male god, uh, for example. So, but what I discovered in the, in the Buddhist tradition I started in was that Zen can be a very masculine form. Not that the practice itself is, but most of the teachers were men. And I then began to hear in the Tibetan tradition that there was a female Buddha named Tara. And to this day, I don't know who it was that told me the story, but I feel like I owe this person my life. The story that I was told in 19, probably 78 or 79, was that Tara was initially this princess, Yeshidawa, which means wisdom moon, who was famous for her spiritual practice and renowned for her compassion, her generosity, uh, her concentration. And so monks and holy men from the kingdom that she lived in came from all around and came to Tara and said, Tara, it, you must pray to have a man's body because as soon as you receive a man's body, surely you will be enlightened just like that. Because at that time it was believed that in order to be enlightened one had to have a man's body. Now this sounds very familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a very old story. And here thousands and eons of time have passed. And what Tara said at that time Princess Yeshidawa said to these monks and holy men was, thank you very much. I have thought often about this matter. Worldly beings are always confused about what is male and what is female. But since most Buddhas have chosen to come in the form of a man, I vow for all time until all suffering is ended to only be enlightened in a woman's body. And so she was. So this figure became my heroine immediately. And she's the one I went halfway around the world to find. And then ended up in 1980 being introduced not only to Tara but to Durga and to Kali in this fascinating dazzling darkness that I had no idea what it meant when I encountered it first in Eastern religions. Other than here were these dark female images that were strong and that were venerated all over. But I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that I felt like they fit I understood them, I couldn't articulate it, but I was captivated by this darkness and I felt like this is something that's missing in this culture, in Western culture, that we need, and, or that I needed, and I didn't know what it was. So it was some time before I went back to Nepal to pursue this. But in the meantime, I 
I had become fascinated by this darkness and I ended up, perhaps that was a gateway, into my own descent. First through amoebic dysentery, almost dying, having an encounter with death, to finally gradually being led to see that in fact over time I had become an alcoholic. And so then my recovery began. And again, it was some, I don't, I don't know if I can really articulate for you quite how Tara related to this process, other than I know that my, my journey to find her led me through the gateway to the bottom of that experience, which is really about seeking spirit to understanding that I would never find through some kind of substance or material uh, world what I was truly seeking. And then there was Tara, the image of the completely fully enlightened feminine. Not like Mary in the Christian tradition who we're taught has no power in and of her own. All her power being derivative through the Father or the Son. Tara is completely and fully enlightened a Buddha, as much as Gautama Buddha or Manjushri or any of the other Buddhas. So here was this heroic being, and she's called Saviorus. She's most often known or called the goddess of compassion, goddess of wisdom, but in fact she is a fully enlightened Buddha. And I make a point now to always address her as the Buddha Tara because this is a form we need to recognize and acknowledge that we have available to us, that we have not had in the West. We have always had the image of the feminine being less than inferior, incapable, whether it's of being priests or presidents. This has been completely crippling, in my opinion, to women in this culture and to men. Because then, you know, these words we use that are so loaded of male and female are truly like Tara says, I think. They, worldly beings are always confused by this idea of what is male and what is female. These are simply aspects of human beingness. And we all have each. The Jungians talk about that in symbolic psychological terms, but it's also biologically true. We all have X and Y chromosomes. So we limit ourselves severely and we polarize and we, and we separate from each other by imagining that this is male or this is female. And again, this is where for me Tara has led the way by cutting through this with the sort of wisdom and saying, no, these are simply different manifestations of being. They're different forms. But I too can be fully and completely enlightened and she vowed to be so and was enlightened. So this started me on a path that had meaning. And uh, I went back when I heard this story about her emerging. To me, this was such wonderful news. Oh yes, I must see this. Because she had taken root and definitely was emerging in my life. Because then I had an image of the feminine that I could follow and uh, identify with and relate to that was empowering, yet peaceful and joyful as well as strong and wise. Uh, unlike the split we have in the West between the virgin and the whore, the kind of separation that we're constantly, this dualism we're constantly faced with. So when I went back to Nepal to see this image of the tar emerging from the rock, having seen the image of the Black Madonna, when I was in India on my way back to Nepal, I found myself in a Shiva temple standing in front of this extremely peaceful image of a black Kali. Now Kali I'd always seen in a very fierce form with multiple arms and you know skeletons hanging from around her neck or her girdle or from her ears. And, but she was very peaceful and in a meditation pose looking very similar to Tara. And she was, as I said, coal black. Something immediately clicked and I said, Tara, Kali, and the Black Madonna are all related. This was strictly intuitive, I don't know why, but then it was when I was in front of that statue in India that I knew I would have to go to Switzerland where this Black Madonna of Einsiedeln was that I'd seen the photograph of, that I'd have to go halfway around the world to find her, but that the darkness gave me a way back into my own culture that I could not find through the traditional images of the Madonna, the disempowered feminine that so often a prayed 
given to us. Um, because I realized that I will always be a student of Tara's and devo devoted to her and study her. And yet there's a way in which I will never be Tibetan, I, am, I will never be Chinese, I will never be Japanese, that there's certain aspects of this practice that are cultural. And what about my roots? I cut myself off, you know, from my own ground of being and my own culture. So going back to going to Switzerland and finding the Madonna after first going and interviewing His Holiness the Dalai Lama about Tara, he was most encouraged, encouraging and gave me his blessing because he understood that Tara and Mary form a marvelous bridge between cultures because they're both images of the compassionate, wise, loving, feminine. And for me, I realized I needed both because Tara is not a physical mother, which Mary is. And Mary gives us the image of the sorrowful mother. There's no image of Tara that I've ever seen that's sorrowful. She's joyful, peaceful, or fierce. Tara is also known as the mother of all the Buddhas. She may, she may not be an earthly mother, but she's the mother of all the Buddhas. But as I think I was saying, the, I found that I needed both images. The womb of enlightenment, and then, the, and then Mary with the actual fruit of a physical womb. A human child who knows the depths of a mother's sorrow. As anyone who's ever born a child knows, that's an experience of enormous joy and a source of great pain because we can't protect our children from suffering. So here we're, this, so the path widened. And no longer was I following only Tara, but I, through Tara, went back and looked at Mary. And then, in exploring Mary and the Black Madonnas of Europe, finally allowing myself to go to Medjugorje, having avoided it, being afraid of being struck Catholic, <laughs> um, I, I realized when I heard how ecumenical her message was, that once again, here was a message of healing for all people, because she was, I was hearing stories of Mary's saying things like, um, God does not divide religions and people, only people do that. From the perspective of the divine, humanity is all one. We create the divisions. This is our error. This is not ordained by any kind of divine authority. And in fact, I'd heard that she'd even pointed out to the visionaries in Yugoslavia that they should emulate a Muslim woman in the village of Sarajevo, Pasha, because she was a great and holy person. So the distinctions were being broken down between different religions and also statements from Mary such as that it's wrong of Christians to look down on people of other faiths that we have to be all people reconciled with one another and love one another and forgive. And we cannot really even begin to imagine that we are praying or meditating unless there's forgiveness in our heart for anyone and everyone who might have harmed us. So when I went to Medjugorje and, and met one of the visionaries and was able to be with the visionaries while they were seeing the apparition of Mary, it came to me later that, in fact, this image of Mary who appears to these young Croatian peasant children, or young people at that time, in my way of thinking, from what I knew about Tara, who is famous for coming in whatever form we need to see her in, she is so compassionate. You know, if you need to see her as a man, she will appear to you in that form. It doesn't matter. Her concern is how she can be the most helpful and serve people and serve all sentient beings. And so it occurred to me, m the understanding I came away with that allowed me peace with these different, all these different images, was this was simply a form of Tara that was appearing. She wouldn't, of course, appear to Croatian people as a Tibetan uh, deity. Of course, she would come in a form that's familiar and comforting and beloved. So that would be Mary. 
So this is, you know, everyone has their own interpretation. This is simply, I claim no theological correctness. This is simply my way of understanding and including these images. Because now, for me, the two are not, are not separate and form this wonderful, very rich, wide bridge that people of many cultures can walk across because we find this image of the, image of the dark feminine which Tara has forms of, Mary has forms of, in many cultures, whether it's Native American culture and it's Hopi Crow Mother or North Northwest Coast in, uh, Indian woman Sonanqua, who's the wild woman of the woods, or the Brazilian Black Madonna, Our Lady of Asparacita, um, or African Yamaya, or Oshun. We have this image of the dark, healing, wise, earthy, juicy, fecund, dancing feminine that can, that's rising up, that's available, it seems, to us all. Well, when I first went to Einsiedon, I arrived precisely at 4 o'clock in the afternoon which is, in my opinion, the best time to arrive at Einsiedeln. Because at 4 o'clock for, I think, over 300 years now, every afternoon, the monks walk down the long aisle of that enormous Baroque basilica to the tiny, black, cave-like marble, completely enclosed chapel, black chapel that the Black Madonna is in within the large basilica, and line up before her and burst into this glorious, beautiful Latin hymn, the Save Regina. And so this is a very mar wonderful moment to encounter and be introduced to this Madonna. And they sang for maybe 15 minutes and then they left. And there were only the old peasant women with their rosaries and their black shawls sitting, saying the rosary. And there she was, with her clouds of beaten gold behind her and silver hearts in an arch all around her shrine. And I don't remember any particular emotion. I remember when the monks started singing, I was elated because I had just been in India with the Dalai Lama and the Tibetans with their wonderful, brilliant orange and saffron and red robes and, and their kind of... Um, unending cheerfulness despite the fact that the Tibetan people have almost been exterminated by the Chinese and their country brutally taken over and they've known enormous suffering. They've lost their entire country and, uh, and their culture has endangered their people. But they are in, invariably joyful. So I'd been with these very happy people and then I walk into this Catholic church and it seemed as though here it was again the kind of dark somberness. The monks all came out with their eyes to the floor, they were all in black. Uh, but the moment they sang, I knew that these were my brothers too. And that their devotion to that Madonna was no different than the Tibetan's devotion to Tara or mine. And I felt a kinship and a door opened that uh, was tremendously moving. And it was the song that gave me the way through and to touch back into the Mary that was planted so deeply and rooted in my heart. I discovered that her roots went all the way around the globe. You know, was it Tara's roots growing into Mary or Mary's roots growing into Tara? For me, this is where they touched. And a, and a whole joyful world was opened again back into my own childhood that I thought I'd lost and had to leave behind, that I had no way to claim. So it was more, I don't know that I could say it was an emotion so much as a whole experience and world I was given back in that moment and that was redeemed. And so then from that experience I began to see that I could take what was meaningful to me from this tradition and I could leave what I no longer related to, that I could claim Mary that I didn't have to give my allegiance to Rome. I didn't have to agree with the Roman Church. And that no one owns Mary and Jesus, or these deities, or these images. And that, in fact, I'd like to free Mary from the Catholic Church because the feminine for us in the West was completely left behind with the Reformation. Many Protestants grow up with no image of the feminine whatsoever. Which, if you talk to some uh, Protestant women ministers, they mourn and ache with that loss of the feminine. 
and wrestle with this dilemma of not having an image of the feminine in their own tradition. So I felt very blessed, in fact, to have this tradition in which there is the feminine. Um, so that's that was the beginning of a whole other level of this journey. And for me, part of what came and part of the message of Mary and that tradition that's been so beneficial is one of forgiveness. And I began to work seriously on that in my own life. And I think um, that the emphasis and Christ's teaching about forgiveness have, are very rich. And that each culture and tradition gives us like a different facet of a gem sort of has certain teachings that it particularly um, has developed and given to the world. And that's one that I found particularly rich. What I also discovered in that church at Einsiedeln that further amplified the connection I sensed between East and West and the fact that there was some parallel here was uh, the priest showed me photographs of a book of the Madonna's altar in the way it had been displayed in the past on the feast of St. Meinrad, who was the founder of that particular monastery. He'd been a hermit in the woods. That's why she's called Our Lady of the Dark Woods, Our Lady of the Dark Forest. She'd been Meinrad's patron in the ninth century, and gradually this enormous monastery grew up around her. But until, I think perhaps about 1983, on Meinrad's, one of Meinrad's feast days, his skull, which had been encased in velvet and jewels, was displayed in the tabernacle under her feet. So you had this image of the dark mother with the infant in her arms with the skull, the jeweled skull underneath. Now to me this was very Eastern and very Hindu. And I immediately thought of the image of Kali or Durga dancing on the corpse. And her her uh, chapel faces the west, which, as the literature pointed out, is, is the direction of death. And she also is the guide to the underworld. Jung thought that this black Madonna was the goddess Isis, a manifestation of Isis. Now, as you can often find in sites of the black Madonna, there will be some anthropological or archaeological basis for that. There might have been an earlier pre-Christian site. I didn't have a translator in German and I was not able to find on my own any anthropological or archaeological evidence. Doesn't mean it isn't there, that there wasn't some pre-Christian site. And Isis was known to be worshipped all throughout the Roman Empire in the second and third century, including as far north as Switzerland and Germany. What I did find that was fascinating, another layer of this site, is that there is, as is often the case, in sites that we as human beings say are sacred and holy, a unique geological feature, a unique feature of the natural history. I was able to interview a paleogeologist at the University of Zurich and discovered that there is a unique crystalline structure in the rock at Einsiedeln that is found nowhere else in Switzerland. Now I doubt that St. Meinrad knew this when he was drawn to this site. I will leave that up to those who speculate about locations of sacred sites. But I simply noted it, and I think it's again important, as I learned from my Native American friends, that often what we might call unusual or strange in white culture by Native peoples or indigenous people is considered holy and made sacred, which in our country in Australia would be sites where uranium is located which native people could identify and indigenous people could recognize, not that they recognized uranium, but by the distinctive plant forms or some unique geological features. They knew that there was something special and powerful about this particular piece of ground. So there's often a, a geological uh, basis for the locations of these sites. And that is a study that bur begs for further exploration, especially with the Black Madonnas. But to get back to St. Meinrad's skull, which has now been removed and is no longer displayed, uh, has been encased in a silver bust of St. Meinrad and placed in the altar that the priests see, uh, that the public does, do not, does not, is not able to see. Fortunately, I was able to go up and look at it. It's in a glass bubble that's set in this altar. But 
what um, death. This is what gives life its authority, isn't it? This is what we want to forget, that we're all being propelled towards at any moment. This to me also was one of the great teachings from Buddhism is impermanence and an awareness of death. And this is also in the Christian tradition. Uh, the good monk, as Brother David Sandra said, keeps death on his shoulder. Again, for me, the Black Madonna was a doorway to acknowledge what we think of as that great mystery that sometimes we call dark or black that we in this culture have made something negative but in fact it is not it's simply another facet of life when we don't recognize it and acknowledge it we lose our life our lives are enriched by acknowledging that in fact our death is coming therefore each moment is precious is a treasure every moment we're alive is there to be treasured so her blackness for me was most um, compelling reassuring uh, a symbol of the mystery that she stood over when she stood over mine red skull i wanted to tell you a story that jumps back to the present here my father died a year ago in December. In this past December, I needed on the anniversary of his death to somehow observe this passing. I'd had the good fortune when my father died to be able to be with him, as was my youngest brother. And because of stories that I had heard uh, of other people doing this, it occurred to me to sing to him as he was dying. Oddly enough, I met, over the next few months, two other women here in my home area whose parents had died in the past year and who had sung to their parents. One woman's family song had been a great part of their upbringing and so they, their mother had cancer and during the months that she was dying, all the family would come and they would sing back to her all the songs that she had sung to them when they were children. And that's how they kept her company and helped her with her dying. And the same with this other friend of mine, Grace. The same thing had happened in her family. And so we got together just before winter solstice this year to come together. These two women didn't know each other, but to tell each other the stories about our parents and to honor their passing and to sing to one another the songs that we sang to our parents as they were dying. It was a most joyful evening. And what I realized today when I went back and looked at a note was that that morning I dreamed of the Black Madonna. So somehow this image of the Dark Mother has allowed for myself something that years ago I might have thought was unthinkable. Sing to someone while they're dying or uh, much less celebrate or mark someone's death by singing with other people? Doesn't that sound morbid? Not at all. It was a kind of passage and ritual that in fact we are so missing in this culture, this acknowledgement of death and the celebration of these lives that gave us our own, these parents this dream of the image having like these small icons over my heart and one is the black madonna and one is Tara and it's the green Tara but the green Tara uh, green in Tibetan also means dark and swarthy and the green Tara it said contains all the other Taras and it's from her are the emanations of the black forms the yellow the white the orange the red the gold so she contains that darkness as well I think in part because of our fear of death and in part because of our enormous lack of acknowledgement of the blood that this country was built on and the labor that was stolen by bringing millions of black people here to perform our labor. The whole cotton economy was based on slave labor. As it, as it was said, cotton is anathema to the abolitionist because you needed 
So the white argument was slaves to pick cotton. But that gets into the material that the Madonna has taken me to today, which is an immersion in African American culture and slave narratives and the literature of the experience of black people and, and native people and indigenous people in this country. You know, the journey has come home. This is the most foreign place of all, is the ground under our own feet. It's easy to go away. It's easy to look at another culture. But now the political implications are, how does this apply at home? Why don't we have black Madonnas in this country? Where are they? We have black people. There are black Madonnas all over Europe that are worshipped by white populations. Montserrat in Barcelona, Einsiedeln in Switzerland, Black Madonna of Częstochowa, Poland, hundreds of them in Europe, as you well know. Why don't we have them in this country? The, the Hispanic community, the Latinos, have Our Lady of Guadalupe. And in fact, Guadalupe is the patron of all the Americas. We, a dark Madonna is the patron of the Americas. But so often in this culture, she is whitewashed, at least in any Anglo church that you walk in. So I hope someday we will see the dark mother where she belongs, which is everywhere, and in all churches because they should be for all people, not just this sect or that. But we're still moving in that direction. But to go back a step, uh, Therese Schroeder Shaker in Denver has this project called The Chalice of Repose, and it's her theory as a performer in music musicologists that the, as I understand it, that monks uh, at Cluny understood that tone and different notes perform the function of attuning the body during the passage into death, and that we in fact in the West have almost like a Tibetan Book of the Dead or Egyptian Book of the Dead, and it's to be found in this medieval liturgy. And I had heard that the monks, when someone was dying, would come and they would sing, and depending on the condition of the person, they would sing certain chants. They knew which were the most helpful and soothing and comforting. And that's where, because I knew that story, I knew to sing to my father which um, might ordinarily have never occurred to me. And if I can think, if I can recall, <clears throat> I'll sing. There were two songs I sang. Gan ki elek Lo ira ra ikata imodi kam ki elek pike tsamoves lo ira ra ikata imodi and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear not for you are with me. And that you who is with me is this dark mother who herself has known so much suffering that she's burned black. And because of her, I was able, after going on this pilgrimage to Poland, to then go to Auschwitz, to go down into the gas chamber, to stand in front of the ovens, and see what we can do to one another that threatens us today. And I don't think I ever would have had the courage to look at 
the kind of hatred and, and racism and anti-Semitism and, and all the nationalisms that tear us and destroy us had I not had the Black Madonna and Tara to go with me into that space where I felt protected and as though um, I could look at, I could be in this place and not be incinerated myself somehow emotionally on the spot, you know, or driven mad with the lack of understanding. And part of what was driven home to me so clearly by seeing and getting an idea of the numbers, not only of people killed at that one site, Auschwitz and Birkenau, but the number of, quote, good people who had to turn their backs and not hear and ignore what is going on that brought, when I came home, made me think, what is it that's going on in my backyard? What's happening in my life that I'm aware of that I don't really want to know about or address in my culture? And I'm of the particular bias that, that for me, often the answer is in my own backyard. And I realize for myself that I am a mother. I have three children, two of whom are sons, and one of whom was getting to be of age where he would have to sign up for the military which is a law in this country. And the United States also happens to be one of the few countries in the world that has had the good conscience to allow people the choice of being a conscientious objector. And I felt as a parent that my children had to make their own choices. It's their lives. But because our systems, our, our bureaucracies, our school, our government does not give young people the information about the law which says that you, we do have this status in this culture, uh, conscientious objector. Yes, you can sign up, you're required to sign up for the military, but you also can choose to be a conscientious objector when you sign up for the military. And when I wrote to try to get information just to give my son the facts, the government maintained that because there was no draft, you couldn't even get the information. And yet, a draft can be brought into effect basically overnight. The draft boards in this country are ready to go. People could be, war could be declared, as was coming very close to happening again with the Persian Gulf. I mean, we did have a war, but in terms of a draft, could be put in place very quickly. This country is ready to go and be militarized uh, very quickly. So, it occurred to me having been through this with my oldest son, who I simply took to a draft counselor and educated him and said, you know, you have to make this choice. And you don't even, don't even tell me what it is, but I want you to have all the information about what the law is and you, you decide in your own conscience. And, uh, which he did. Then my daughter didn't have to face this. Why do women not have to face? Will we resolve conflict by killing someone? This is what all the young men in this culture, whether they know it or not, have to be faced with, are faced with, if they're going to comply with the law. Do you think violence is a solution? I have since worked with many young people, including young men, who are struggling to articulate these values, which we do a very limited job of helping them with in this culture. Young people today are struggling and, uh, for wisdom and seeking it. They may look like like all they care about are dates or school or cars, but they are deeply concerned about what is happening in our society. They see the homelessness, they see the poverty, they see the racism. They want to be a part of, of creating a solution and they need our help. Western culture seems based in this kind of hideous dualism, an idea of separ separation and hierarchy which is what, to me, was so um, enlightening about the Buddha's insights, that there is no such thing as separation, that this is an illusion that we create with our mind constantly, but it's in fact illusory. That nothing arises independently in and of itself, that we, I am sitting here because I'm based on a chair which is on a floor which is based on the ground and someone made this chair and someone made my clothes and you know there's this, we are constantly informed and existing because and with 
others and in relationship. And somewhere in our Western thought we have this idea of the individual and we imagine we're separate and we can separate ourselves from our environment and we're by poisoning ourselves we're learning that we cannot do this. That this in fact is anathema. So it was also interesting to me and I think telling metaphorically that astrophysicists have discovered that 90% of what they think the universe is composed of is dark matter, which is invisible to us. That the luminous world, what we see with light, is only perhaps 10% of what is. The rest is in darkness because it's outside of our range of being able to see in the luminous world. So to me, the world is not as it seems. It, in fact, is reversed. And we know so little compared to what is. And again, science continually confirms this and sounds like a kind of restatement in quantitative terms and formulas what Eastern wisdom traditions have maintained all along. So we also live in this very dangerous time, but we also live in this incredibly rich period where we have access to all these traditions and can bring in the combined wisdom that all humanity and the keepers of wisdom such as indigenous people you know this information is now all coming forward for us to treasure and to value and I'm sure that our survival I'm not sure what do I know I'm one person but it would seem that perhaps our survival might be dependent upon our ability to be open to the enormous diversity that is and to be able to honor the diversity. In biology we see that strength comes from creatures finding all these different niches from diversity. The monocultures are extremely fragile and subject to, to being wiped out very quickly. Strength is in diversity, not in monoculture. And in fact, what I realized that in this country, you know, they talk about Columbus discovering America. We all know that that isn't true. But what I realized the other day in speaking with someone is that we are still discovering America. America is an idea. America is a dream. America is the dream of a utopian society in which all people alike, women, men, people of color, regardless of faith, religion can live in justice and in harmony. This is a utopian dream. This is what America is founded on. This is the dream that we are living out and that draws people to this country and that we are in the process of creating. But America has not yet come into existence. This is the challenge today. And this is where I think the Black Madonna can help us by number one bringing, helping usher the sacred back in to our life and giving us this image of the Dark Mother, a figure that can reach across many lines of ethnicity and diversity so that we have something that, that we can find that can unite us and that we can all honor. What I would love to see someday would be a celebration, for example, in a city like San Francisco, where a building, uh, a museum, uh, the Mission Cultural Center could be taken over and different ethnic groups could come and build altars to their dark mother. Whether it's the Madonna of Einsiedon, Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, Our Lady of Esparcido and from Brazil, Kali, Durga, uh, Crow Mother, however she is honored in these different traditions. But house this in one structure so that we could walk through and see our common connections and yet see how differently we might honor this image of what we call the feminine. It is really the great mothering of all. And then once these altars were all constructed and people had had a chance to see them wandering from room to room, then take these statues, these images, these banners, these paintings, whatever they are, out to the street and have a giant celebration and procession like they do in Italy uh, and walk through the streets, for example, to Dolores Park and then have there's a woman in New York who's created a folk opera to the Black Madonna in honor of the Mother Earth, Italian folk opera. 
because it, the land is full of black Madonnas, and have a celebration. In Mexico, there are groups of dancers that go and dance all over Mexico for Guadalupe, for the Virgin. It could be a tremendous cross-cultural celebration. So this is my, this would be an image of of what fears people would have to work through to create this kind of event, but how unifying and how strengthening for the people this could be all through this dark mother. On this theme of, of the answers in my backyard, when I came home from Europe, one of I'm from Texas, and one of my uncles challenged me and said, you know, well, we have a black Madonna in Texas. You've been all over the world, we know this, but, you know, thinking, first of all, why did I ever leave Texas, but <laughs> to assert, well, we have them here too. So I took up his challenge and uh, went down to San Juan de los Lagos in South Texas, where there is at least one black or dark Madonna, La Morenita, the little dark one. Um, again, a miracle worker and a healer in an enormous shrine built by farm workers and migrant workers with pennies saved and a constant site of pilgrimage in the Latino community from workers all over this country. A beautiful shrine. So I went to South Texas and, and a friend said, oh, you can stay with my friend Marion. You know, she's got a big house. Stay there. Little did I know that Marion was Sister Marion, a Sister of Mercy, and she was running a refugee shelter. At that time, it was the terrible uh, a lot of refugees who were literally trapped in the valley. The, the Catholic bishop there said that this is the largest concentration camp we've had since World War II on American soil because thousands and thousands of refugees were trapped in the valley and the border was literally moved 60 miles north wherever the border patrol was. That was the border. Um, so I went and stayed in a refugee shelter and began to hear the stories firsthand of the death squads of El Salvador and people who'd escaped from Guatemala. El Salvador and discovered that the death squads from El Salvador in fact even operated in, and in this country. Very frightening and disturbing stories. Over time, and that's when I discovered the Madonna of the Disappeared. Robert Lentz's painting of a contemporary dark mother set in a Central American jungle with the white hand of the death squad in the corner of the painting because she is united and in solidarity with the disappeared. This image burned. These stories burned. And as I stayed in, in contact with Sister Marion, what I found out over time is that now we've moved our refugee problem into Mexico. Many refugees are stopped there, so it's not so much a problem in this country in quite the same way in terms of the thousands and tens of thousands that there were in, in the valley in South Texas. Now the problem has become, and she's closed the Casa de la Merced in terms of being a refugee shelter. It's now an AIDS hospice. And she said now the biggest problem in the valley is the phenomenal environmental pollution of the United States from the Mexican side because we're moving all of our many big companies are moving and dumping pollutants right into the Rio Grande and destroying the river and the surrounding the communities which were already the poorest in the country the, the colonia is still people there without sewage, without running water, without electricity this is so called the United States and now they're being faced with some of the worst chemical and most toxic pollutants and babies being born without brains a concentration of this, this has been increasingly reported widely of what's happening in the valley around certain sites where we're dumping pollutants. So uh, the Madonna being there, I don't know what the connection is except that her presence certainly drew me to it and will draw me back to that and has kept me in connection. And more and more people are becoming aware through the Border Witness Program of what, you know, the third world country isn't somewhere else. We have it, we're creating it. Not only do we have it, we're expanding it in our own backyard and killing many people in the process. She is such a patron of the farm workers and the, and the Mexican people there. And in fact, one of the things that I discovered about San Juan de los Lagos in South Texas is that in the 30s, the story that I was told is that the Madonna was appearing in a rock in a field. Once again, she was outside the church 
And the peasants were going, and the, and the people were going to worship her there. And the priests became uncomfortable, and that's when they got a copy made of the Madonna of San Juan de los Lagos in Jalisco, Mexico, where many of these people were from, so that they wouldn't make the pilgrimage down there, and they would come inside the church. And so they put this copy of the Madonna in the church where she is today. That's a legend. I don't claim that that was factual, but that is a story that someone who's researched this, one of the priests I met, told me. So um, perhaps she is again a focal point for healing um, in a situation where it's particularly needed. And they certainly do need miracles and healing to turn around the border, our border problems in this country. It used to concern me that when I would, when the book came out and I went and spoke and I gave my slideshow of the images that I've seen and then those that I've expanded and that people have sent me, that um, there were only a few African American or Hispanic people in the audience. But as one friend, as Evelyn had, I think, said to me, you know, it's white people that need to be educated often. It is news to most white people that there is this image of the Divine Feminine that's dark, that shows us that darkness is also good, that affirms divinity, sacredness, wisdom, that all come together in this image of the black or the dark Madonna. It also, when you go into the Caribbean, when you go into South America, you clearly bring in the African tradition as well. Um, and in fact, many Haitian people apparently go to Pennsylvania where there's a copy of the Polish Black Madonna and make a pilgrimage there. So again, she has enormous political implications for healing, I think, in this country. And has been a mirror for me and a challenge to me to look into my own racism. Because I might think I'm progressive, I might think I'm liberal-minded, but I cannot grow up in this society that is so, racism is so inbred and not take it on. And it's been a slow peeling back and the, again, the Black Madonna. How could I go out and show these images and not be looking at my own background, my own racism and begin to peel this off and through this Madonna continually meet and reach out and make more and more friends in the African American community and begin to find out what America's really about for not just the very small, narrow group that I might have grown up in, but for other peoples in this country to get the kind of richness and um, benefit of their experience and begin to build bridges. So it's been an enormous gift and education that will, I'm sure, continue my entire life. In France, on my way to Poland from France, I had the opportunity to go to where I was told there was a Black Madonna and discovered uh, at Les Saint Marie de la Mer on the Mediterranean, at the mouth of the Rhone, I think it is, it's coming in at that point. I discovered that in fact there was not a Black Madonna in this church, but when I went down into the crypt, there was this gorgeous Black Saint Sarah, the patron and the queen of the gypsies. And as I was standing in this very dark, hot room with no windows, but hundreds of candles, tall white tapers blazing, with Saint Sarah, this life-size statue over in the corner, all dressed in brocade and lace, with crutches as so many of these black uh, divinities have behind them, evidence of miracles of healing they performed uh, behind her. I'm standing back to one side trying to photograph this very unusual image, life-size image that's standing sort of free form on the floor when a man comes in, a gypsy man comes in and he looks at her for a moment, doesn't even notice me in the corner and immediately goes over to her and begins to open her dress and embrace her as though she's a woman. I felt I was seeing this most intimate moment, I shouldn't even be there. But what I discovered is that this is simply how the people respond to St. Sarah and how they treat her. They venerate her, they embrace her, they kiss her. Once a year they have a great celebration. They take her to the sea, there's blessings. In exploring this site and finding out about the statue of Sarah, the queen of the gypsies and her, their patron, again a healer, that she's also called Sarah Kali. And bam, 
uh, again, the intuition back from India years before of these images are connected. This Kali is connected to Black Mary, to Durga, to Tara. Here, at least in this one instance, there was obviously some clear-cut connection that could be made. But you know, this whole idea of connection and making these things be related is very Western. You know, as though there has to be one source. There are many, many sources of this darkness, whether it's the earth, the meteors, as I think we spoke of earlier, um, or the color of people's skin, or the darkness of the vast sky, emptiness, the darkness of the womb, which gives us life. There are connections between Tara is, Mary is often the star of the sea. Tara was a boat woman and, and a star as Mary is often described as the queen of the heavens, Tara is also queen of... I don't know that she would be called a queen. That might not be precise. I don't, I don't want to say. I'd have to, I'd have to think about that and look. But there are definite parallels that have to do with water, with being a guide, with being a boat woman. Tara is known as not only the boat woman, but the boat that carries us across. She herself is the vessel. And Mary is described as a vessel. And again, a guiding star. And there may be, one would have to explore this, and different scholars have their many different opinions. I claim not to have any definitive opinion on this matter. But a connection possibly between Astarte, the earlier Semitic goddess, and these countries that we think are so far apart in these cultures, there was tremendous travel and cross-fertilization going on. I mean, Alexander was in India. Alexander the Great, you know, who's coming from um, Alexandria, from Egypt and from Greece. There were trade routes, and so there was a lot of mixing that, that we, as in, in my upbringing, was never, I was never exposed to. I always thought these worlds were quite separate, but in fact there's a lot of fertilization that took place back in the pre-Christian eras. Um, so in terms of symbol, Tara is sometimes depicted sitting on a moon, or the moon is in her hand. There is an associate, association with the moon, but there's also an association with the sun. But Mary has an association with the moon, but she's also the woman clothed in the sun in the book of Revelation. So, uh, who, and some would say that that is Mary, that that's not just the woman clothed in the sun, or as the wonderful 17th century Christian mystic Jane Lett, English mystic, said, she was the woman of wonder, or wonder woman. She, in the 17th century, she was calling this woman, this image that comes in the book of Revelation. Which brings me back around to another thread I want to weave in here that connects back to the wilderness and to the earth. But I discovered, I mentioned this first book that I had written being uh, about the wilderness, women in the wilderness. And part of what I discovered was in 1694 there were a group of German pietist men fleeing religious persecution in Europe who came and settled in the woods outside of what is now uh, Philadelphia in the Wissahican Woods. And they called themselves the Order of the Women in the Wilderness because they believed that the world would soon end and the sign of the second coming was the appearance of the woman, of the feminine, emerging. And it would be this woman from the book of Revelation who had fled into the wilderness and the wilderness had cared for her and saved her from the demon. But she would come closed in the sun with stars on her head and the moon under her feet. And their task was to keep a vigil and wait for her and prepare for that second coming. And so too today, in some ways, I think that what we're experiencing now is a second coming. Not in the literal, biblical sense, but for the feminine to emerge and the values that have been, sort of, that have been relegated to the world of women, the values of nurturing, of community, um, for these to move into the center of the, of the society, rather than the marketplace, which is what's at the center now and drives our communities. Were these values to be moved into the center, brought back from the wilderness where they've been banished and included and integrated, it would be the second coming. It would be a new world. 
And so today what I like to say and what I said to my friends at Easter, in keeping with the Russian Orthodox tradition of dyeing eggs red and giving them at Easter as a sign of greeting, the story was, to weave another thread in here from our own Christian tradition, one of the legends is that's kept alive in the Russian church is that Mary Magdalene, having left the tomb and, and received the good news that Christ, in fact, had risen and was to tell the other disciples, she found some of the other disciples on the road and they wouldn't believe her that Christ had risen. And so an old woman was walking past with a basket of eggs. So Mary reached into her basket, took the egg, and turned it red in her hand, and then said to the disciples, He is risen. He is truly risen. And the legend goes on to say that she went and did this in front of Herod, and that she went to Rome and did this in front of Tiberius. All with the language implying that she, in fact, had the power to do it. It wasn't something that happened to her. She, in fact, turned them red by the power of her experience with the Christ. So today what I said uh, for Easter is I gave red eggs to my friends and this Sunday is the Russian Easter, Orthodox Easter, the great resurrection and the return of Persephone to Demeter and the spring and the life coming back into the world. I said, she is risen. She is truly risen. So sisters, dance and beat the drum. Take up the practice of rejoicing. The most important message I've gotten from all this, and she probably has many messages for as many different hearts as there are to hear her message, because her message is one for our hearts, uh, is a message that came to me through the material I've been drawn to since Longing for Darkness came out, studying and immersing myself in the African-American experience and going back to the place where my family comes from in East Texas and because my family's been there for a while, not only since the turn of the century, being able to go into homes of some of the older members of the black community because I, this generation that's old now in the 80s and 90s are the grandchildren of people who were in slavery looking for more of these buried stories that have been passed on and kept in families, uh, living traditions of, of, about slavery and stories from their ancestors. I was able to take this book with the Black Madonna. Somebody might not have read it or understood it, but they could see the photograph and they'd know that I meant well. So she gave me passage into a whole other world that ordinarily would not be open or available to me. But somehow, because it was an image of the sacred and it was black, you know, Deacon Haggerty would talk to me. Pammy and, and Leon Rivers would talk to me. And uh, I think it was Mabel Rivers talking about Leon's grandfather who'd been in slavery. The great teaching that was passed on in that family that's alive and that Mabel, who's worked as a maid all her life, was kind enough to share with me was that what the grandfather, Sam Adkins, had taught them was that we have to choose to love when there's reason to hate. And if anybody has reason, many people in this country of African American origin have reason, but so many have chosen to love. And this, for me, has been the most powerful teaching of the Black Madonna and has been a great inspiration. And to hear Mabel talk about, you know, encounters with the Klan in East Texas, in this little bitty God-forsaken place called Uncertain Texas, where she lives. Not a lot of protection there. Um, and to continue to choose to love. And that was the legacy of Sam Atkins, this former man who'd been enslaved by us. So for me, this is the teaching, and it's completely consonant with what Mary is saying at Medjugorje. We have to forgive one another. There's a very moving passage in a book called Mary's Message. It's a very ecumenical statement about what Mary is saying. And I'm sure it's said in all the apparitions. 
but she, Father Yozo, who's been the chaplain to the visionaries, who I also had the privilege of meeting, said, Mary said, you know, you have to get the people to pray. And he said, well, fine, thinking, okay, well, we'll all kneel down and we'll say some prayers. And she said, no, you have to really pray. And then he understood that he didn't know what that meant. And, me and he was informed that to really pray, one has to look into one's heart. If there's any hardness, any hatred, any resentment towards anyone else, we have to forgive and bless that person. Well, that's not easy. I, for one, had, you know, quite a list of completely justifiable, righteous uh, difficulties with others. But this has been the great teaching for me. Choosing to love when there's reason to hate. Forgiving. Understanding that we are all one another's brothers and sisters. We are all one family. And that we have to be reconciled with one another. And that that takes an active cultivation of the life of the Spirit. And it takes an active turning away of the values of this culture. And affirming, as you are doing with this work, as I hope we are all doing, that it's Spirit that gives us life. That without our spirit, without a whole soul, we are walking dead. And we know many people who go through life. And myself, as someone who struggled with alcoholism, that was a living death. I've been given a completely new life. And for this, I'm very grateful. And one of the reasons I talk about alcoholism so openly at this point in my life is because uh, what I've learned over the years for myself having found a practice of recovery and steps that I can take in order to maintain what really is a state of connection with other people with the world uh, that's what gets cut off with substance abuse which is really an illness and I've come to understand that that my system may be biochemically different that basically I have an allergy and my system doesn't metabolize alcohol and sugar the way yours might but that's no more to be ashamed of than being allergic to tomatoes or chocolate we have made it so shameful in this society that I I take the opportunity from time to time even though it might be awkward or a little difficult to talk about it and acknowledge that that this is something so simple that we have made so terrible and shamed and degraded people, thereby keeping ourselves trapped in this horrible destructive cycle that's really about a drive for our deepest need, which is for spirit. As Carl Jung said, it takes spirit to cure spirit. I may have a medical condition uh, that has to do with biochemistry and, and allergies, that, ex that was expressed with the symptom of alcoholism, but the solution for me, the, the healing, the remission has been, in, has been spiritual. That doesn't mean religious. It means choosing a life of the Spirit and choosing those values. And in the Tibetan tradition, I was fortunate enough to be exposed to the Delog, who's the person in the community that might suddenly become deathly ill might die, but learns, in fact, how to descend into the underworld and to come back. And any of us who have gone through the experience of addiction and who have come back know how to move back and forth. And we are here to share that information so that other people who uh, can find their way back, so that, so that people are not lost. And if we don't talk about it, if I don't acknowledge it, if I just try to act like, oh, well, I've always had my life completely organized and wonderful and happily <laughs> integrated and there's been no struggle, uh, then how can you connect with me? Because we all struggle. Life is a difficult matter for everyone, especially today. And this is a rampant problem in our society, I think precisely because we've tried to turn our back on spirit. So we're drowning ourselves in drugs and alcohol, and we're killing our children. So I think it's high time we get rid of this onus about being an addict, no matter what it is. And, and uh, I choose, you know, if people want to make fun of uh, people who are in recovery, that's fine. That's their choice. But it's given me my life. 
And I hope that I can be useful in, to others by acknowledging that, yes, I had this problem, and yes, there is a solution. And for me, this is where I take the hand of the Black Madonna and Tara and gird myself with their strength and all these spiritual practices. And this is how I have followed and been able to stay on this path. Black Madonnas are still, people still approach them with problems of fertility, with problems of love. Again, it's she is the living carrier of the ancient pre-Christian traditions of the Earth Mother, the goddess of love, the goddess of fertility. In Poland, when, when they go to celebrate the Assumption, it's also, they're also bringing her the grains from the harvest. People talk about making a pilgrimage so they can become fertile, so they can bear a child. There was a child with us on the pilgrimage who was born on the pilgrimage because his mother had made the pilgrimage, got pregnant on it the year before, then she had the baby. Now he's walked it every year. Um, so there's this great connection with fertility. She can heal. You know, nothing is impossible to the forces and the powers of transformation. And that's what we're evoking. And these, this is something very important to say, I think. Yes, we have all these images outside. But what I've learned from studying and the way it seems to me from the Buddhist system, and as I understand what these images are about, is that they're these wonderful filters and doors that allow us into another world, and they also filter the limits and, and problems of our own minds through this image of the sacred, distilling the streams that are evoked within our own being. But these are really mirrors for what's within. The greatest teaching for me of the Buddha was that his enlightenment was in no way divine. What he did was simply his enlightenment. Being enlightened is what it means to be fully and completely human. And this was the gift that I was given in that tradition. That I didn't have to be divine. That I didn't have to be male. That I could be female. And fully enlightened means to be fully and completely human, that these are all powers and capacities within us. And so these images of compassion and generosity and healing and wisdom and, and the devotion that we give them and the practices are ways of evoking that within our own nature, within our own hearts and minds. This is the great gift.